Hello, my name is Katie Coolis, and the topic that I chose for my research project is the connection between the medical model and the social model of disability. I think that I have an interesting background for this topic because I'm on both sides. I'm a speech pathology and audiology major, which is on the medical side, and an education studies major, which is on with a, dis with a concentration in disability studies, which is on the social side. Uh, this is something that I've wanted to find a connection between because I can see it from both sides. Um, Catherine Kudlick, in a comment on the borderland of medical and disability history first, where she talks about whether disability history and history of medicine are rival siblings or conjoined twins. Uh, this continued to lead my research and my findings, trying to determine if they are connected to each other or what they are really to each other. Uh, Kudlick was responding to an article that Beth Linker wrote and something that she pointed out was that Beth Linker offers a generous thought-provoking response that ends with the plea, we should work to make these connections rather than throwing up dividers between medical and disability history. But before we continue more with that, I thought it would be important to discuss the medical model and the social model. In Disability History, Humanity Worth Defending, written by Darren Minark and Timothy Lintner, there is a table that defines the medical model where a child has a medically diagnosed disability that is preventable, curable, and, or improved with rehabilitation. It focuses on diagnosis, labeling, and the impairment first. It has an emphasis on the educational environment that improves the impairment, which may mean alternative services and settings instead of inclusive settings. Um, it also means that since society sees disability as not the norm and sees people with disabilities as needing to adapt and fit in, obviously not looking good for the medical community. The social model, on the other hand, seeks to change social society in order to accommodate people living with an impairment. It does not seek to change people with impairments to accommodate society. It supports the view that people with disabilities have the right to be fully participating citizens on an equal basis with others. It sees disability as the result of an interaction between people living with impairments in an environment filled with physical, attitudinal communication and social barriers. It therefore carries the implication that the physical, attitudinal communication and social environment must change to enable people living with impairments to participate in society on an equal basis with others. This model recognizes people with disabilities as vital contributors to society, not as burdens or challenges. When learning about the social model, the first thing that popped in my head was the first chap chapter in a disability history of the United States written by Kim Nielsen. The first chapter discusses how the indigenous people treated disability. I, it says, I say this loosely because it didn't have a, t like, the indigenous people didn't have a term for disability. How it was discussed in the book was that if a person was an active member in their community, then they were respected. If they were not an active member or they had a negative spirit, then they were not welcomed in the community. Here is a part from the reading. As long as an individual could sustain meaningful relationships that involved emotional or labor reciprocity, regardless of cognitive, physical, or emotional capacities, and lived out balance, they were considered dis they were not considered disabled. Reciprocity and and its consequential ties mattered foremost to defining someone's competency. Now that I've discussed the two models, the history about the intersection of these are very interesting. Catherine Cudlick's comments uh, was full of information, including the medical including that the medical history founders two of who were physicians themselves, believed history of medicine to be on par with anatomy, physiology, and bacteriology and specified science best practice by and for physicians. Dis disability history founders, none of whom were physicians themselves, believed the history of disability to be on par with histories of race, gender, and social class, one best used to advance the lives of disabled people and the cause of disability rights more broadly. In past decades, scholars have been uncovering what may understood to be medicine's hidden past where professional gain too often trumped improving the lives of those deemed marginal. 
With the rise of professional medicine in the 19th century, they have argued certain hierarchies had been established that privileged and able-bodied white males of European origin in effect creating the norm against which all others could ever compete. This started to shape research agendas and questions, creating for some the notion that medicine is the villain. During the 20th century, increasingly influential medical professionals in Western Europe and North America performed experiments in involuntary sterilizations, aggressively promoted eugenics, and engaged in the practices such as physician-assisted suicide in the name of health and progress, most without input from those who were actually affected. According to Douglas Baden, doctors then believed that the tendency of a human race was to improve itself consistently. Then, barring something out of the ordinary, humanity moved ever upward away from its animal origins and towards greater perfection. Normality was implicitly defined as that which advanced progress, or at least did not impede it. Abnor abnormality was that which pulled humanity back towards its past, towards its animal origins. Down syndrome, for example, was called monolism by the doctor who first identified it in, 19, in 1866 because he believed the syndrome to be the result of a biological reversion by Caucasians to the monoracial type. Also, teachers of the deaf at the end of the century spoke of making deaf children more like normal people by and less like savages by forbidding them to use sign language, and they opposed deaf marriages by a rhetoric of evolutionary pro progress and decline. The concept of a cure shows that even though it was all meant to be good in relation to the disease, it changed to shape thinking about disability and disabled people in a problematic way. This then created incurables and and this, was, this term was also used with other terms such as cripples and invalids. This was a part of the medical model of thinking, trying to find something to fix instead of trying to help them have access and succeed. This is something that we are still facing today. The social model was created around 1980, and it was during the fight for the American, it was before the fights for the Americans with Disabilities Act. It has still been expanding ever since. The disability studies was created based on this idea, and it is still growing from university to university. Um, after the brief history some of some of the points that I thought were important, Cudla continued her comments by stating that we need to challenge the divide between the pathology and the social models of disability. It is not time to erase it. Rather, we need to confront it with better questions and critical tools. Scholars in both subfields must have a deeper appreciation for where it comes from. What is at stake and who benefits most or least by removing this particular binary? And we must always be asking who determines what is beneficial to begin with, how it is defined and what might our cause or, or what might cause our definition to change over time. As Linker notes, while it is true that disability can exist with, without disease and vice versa, the two have had an intimate relationship for centuries, and in some cases, they are exceptionally <laughs> linked. Um, but beyond what, per, what portion of the disease state we deemed to be important, it's a matter of framing. In terms of the disease process, a, person's, a person affected or affected and how we approach the complex intersection between individual and society. While we may find ourselves looking at many of the same people, historical situations and documents, our different grounding will call forth different sets of questions and answers. According to Kudlik, the two models are like hats um, that are different in color, style, and texture, not to mention that we should probably wear them differently in public. Perhaps the best solution would be to occasionally exchange our hats, but only if we take it take a long time inquire, inquiring and looking in the mirror, which leaves me in a gray area, which is the same as the connection between the disability or the social model and the medical model of disability. So I guess I will ask you this on what you think. Is the connection 
two rival siblings or conjoined twins? And what are you going to do about it?